probably as pivotal as any passage in the Old Testament for understanding why Christmas, the passage, why the Exodus experience. Why the Exodus experience. And I want to read a text to you this morning uh, out of this lengthy narrative, which we won't have time to read, but kind of to get us on course about why the Exodus experience. During the night, this is in chapter 12 and verse 31 of Exodus. During the night, Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron. Now remember, he didn't want to see them. He didn't want them around. The plagues have been going on. Now we're at the end of the last plague, the plague of the death of the firstborn. These mighty acts of God. How many of you need a mighty act of God in your life today? Oh, I certainly do. And we're at the end, the last of those plagues, and it says that it has occurred, and he has, and so he summons, Pharaoh does, Moses and Aaron, and he says, up. Now, I like, uh, in my scripture, it has an exclamation point. I, I think that merits a little bit of oomph when we say, up. You agree with that? I mean, when you want to exclaim something, don't you raise your voice a little bit, give it a little bit more energy? And can you imagine with his son dead, with the firstborn of all of his household dead, with every firstborn animal of all that he owned dead, he wanted these people gone. And he said to them, up, leave my people. You and the Israelites, go. Now, drop down to the end of that paragraph in the last part of verse 32 and find something that's very unique. Not only up, not only go, but before you go, bless me. Isn't that amazing? Do you realize that the dilemma that you have in your life and I have in my life, that God longs to deliver us from that and not only to deliver us, but to send us with a word of get out of here now, take whatever you want, take all that you want. And by the way, before you go, I know you're right, so bless me before you leave. This hard heart of Pharaoh was broken and he leaves. Why? The Exodus experience. Pray with me. Father, this morning, as we look at this wonderful story of how you worked in the life of the people of Israel, we find a foreshadow of how you worked in and through the life of your son to effect each one of us with a deliverance that gives us a departure set on a path of purpose. God, help us to hear and to follow today, that we may go on in the work of your kingdom. I pray and I ask this through Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen. And our story today, probably one of the more familiar stories of the Old Testament, we find at least four markers that I want us to look at through the text in this first part of the book of Exodus. The first has to do with being in a dilemma. Now, uh, I want to help express that in a very simple way that probably most of us walked in today, we paid no attention to. How many of you came in here today? If that person next to you doesn't have their hand up, they're either asleep or not listening. We all came in, but very few of us paid attention to how to get out. What is that? word over that door over if you're visiting with us you look like a bright young lady tell me what is that word over the top of that door exit where do you suppose we got that word exit we got it right out of this book from this word exodus which means to depart and when you find yourself in something and my guess is you're hoping in 20 minutes to be out of it don't hope too much. But you came in with the hope to get out. 
But you know what I hope is that when you get out, you've got somewhere to go that matters. And you know, there's some of you here today hoping that you'll get something while you're in here that before you go out will help things to matter. And God's people were living out the prophecy that God had given to Abraham. We studied him last week and how that from his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed and, and, and we had the promised land and we had all these good things going on. But then there was that little subscript in the narrative that said, uh, but your people will be 400 years in bondage, but I will call them up out of Egypt. You remember us talking about being sure that you get the eastwardness out of your life and start going Godward. Because when you go eastward, you're always away from God in the biblical text, theologically and symbolically, and what God wants you to do is go Godward. And these people have headed out, and they left, and of course Abraham had Isaac, and we have the patriarchs, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob becomes Israel as he wrestles with the angel, and he begins to have kids. And he has 12 of them. And one of them, 10 of them didn't like. And they let the dad believe he was dead, you remember. And they were going to kill him. But the older brother said, I'm not to be a part of that. And uh, he kind of probably thought they wouldn't go along with him. And so he... Do y'all ever do things to get people to do what you want to do and they think that they chose to do it and it's in their best interest? Well, that's what the older son Reuben got the rest of his brothers to do. Let's don't kill him, let's just sell him. We'll tell dad he's dead. That'll, that'll fix us. We ain't got to bother with him anymore. And we'll get money to boot. So that's exactly what they did. They killed a lamb, put that blood all over that coat of many colors, uh, sent Joseph by slave traders off to Egypt where he ends up in Potiphar's house, you remember. And they go back and they tell Israel, Joseph's dead. Got killed by a wild beast. Here's his coat, here's the blood, here's all the, you know, good thing they didn't have CSI. <laughs> He'd have known better, but they didn't have that. So, you know, this is all the story and, you know, it forever changes Jacob or Israel's life. He, he is saddened and not even overcome by that sadness by the birth of Benjamin that will come and take the life of that beloved wife of his. So all that's occurred and, and then you remember uh, they forgot. Have you forgot some of your dilemmas in your past? You think you're safe and past them? Well, what happens if they get resurrected and they come back? The Bible does say something about you can be sure your sins will what? Find you out? Oh, they got found out, didn't they? They went back. Now he's gone to Potiphar's house. He's gone to Pharaoh's prison. But he had this unique gift, and he interpreted dreams. And as a result, he ends up as second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt, the most powerful place on the planet during that time. And a famine comes, bringing a about the very dream that put Joseph in place. And sure enough, here comes his brother. Now, I always would like to get a, a, a little blip from everybody in the service. What would you do? <laughs> if you were treated this way, spent 14 years in prison and enslaved, and you had a chance to get even, what would you do? Not many of us would weep broken heartily in forgiveness and in compassion for those who did that to us. That's why he's a type of Christ in the Old Testament. You see, that's how God does. And I love the story of the... Man, this isn't even in my sermon, but I'm kind of I'm letting God just have his way this morning. We're going to get to it, okay? But do you know the story of the man that fell in love. It's an old story in Eastern literature, and he fell in love with this woman, and he just loved her so much, but the woman was jealous of the man's mother. Now, I know none of you ladies were ever jealous of your husband's mother, 
I mean, after all, you never could clean or cook or do anything else as well as you could, right? Oh, y'all laugh a little. That is true. I see it a lot, okay. And, uh, but in this story, uh, the woman who was loved by the man says, if you really love me, then you go and you kill your mother and bring me her heart. Boy, this really, that sounds barbaric, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it was in the East, so maybe it was. That was funny. <laughs> so, what happens? Even as distraught as he is over it, he goes, he kills his mother, and he bears the heart of his mother to bring to his bride to show that he truly loves her first and above all else. And as he's making his way, as he's making his way to his soon-to-be bride with the heart of his mother, he stumbles and falls. And he drops his mother's heart. And it's dark, and he can't find it. And then he hears the voice of his mother's heart crying out, Son, are you okay? Son, are you okay? See, that's how God loves us. When we do our worst, he does his best. And God's heart was listening when Israel began to cry out. And God heard the cry. In fact, it was in the midst of their dilemma, just like your crisis and mine. It was in the midst of the crisis that God came. Now, what causes dilemma for us? Well, it's usually when that piece of us that is us feels threatened, and because we're threatened, we mobilize to meet that threat. We've got a couple of folks in here that practice this for a livelihood, and uh, if you were to ask them, what are the two emotional responses to all threat and perceived threat? They would tell you fear and anger. And we have a classic example of that in our text today for what we see is a group of Egyptians who because they loved Joseph allowed him to bring his family to Goshen, but now that that family's grown, they are paranoid, they are afraid, they believe they have a dilemma, they're going to be overtaken, and oh my goodness, if we go to war, they'll side with the enemy, and we will be lost. So we need to oppress them. And some of you may be here today, and because of somebody else's fear and paranoia, you're being oppressed. But, you know, I, I found that uh, uh, there's another kind of demon that walks around, and most of us is when we get in a dilemma and we get afraid and we get angry and we turn that anger inward, we don't have oppression, we have depression. In fact, psychology says it's the common cold of mental illness, which means, guess what, most every one of you either have it or have had it. Yes, God knows and you know. I may not know and I may not can see it on your face and you didn't say amen and affirm the truth of what I said. But let me tell you, it's true. We have those dilemmas. Are you in a dilemma today? Something you came in here in and you need to get out of? Well, God's got a word for you today from this story. And so the scripture says that in the midst of their dilemma, they call out to God. Look in Exodus 2 in verse 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. This is the period where Moses course is left this is the period where all those hundreds of years have transpired in fact the Bible says 430 years to the day and during that long period the king of Egypt died 
The Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out. And their cry for help, they cried for help because of their slavery that went up to God in that cry. And I like that next phrase. You might want to underline that next phrase. God heard them. God heard them. I don't know what your dilemma is today, but I can tell you, if you'll cry out to God, he's listening. You may have cut his heart out, but he still cares for you. Scripture says they had a dilemma. And they cried out. And they were in crisis. Do we live in a world that's in crisis? Read your newspaper where a 25-year-old pro-professional linebacker kills his girlfriend and goes to his coach and his general manager and tells them thank you for allowing him the experience of professional football and then takes that same gun and shoots himself. We live in a world where people are desperate. And it is no secret that in the lives of people in this room, there's desperation. And if it's not in your life, it's in the life of someone you know and you love. And so we have a dilemma. Sparked by fear, our response turns against the things and the ways of God, and it leaves us in crisis, and we need a deliverer. And Israel needed a deliverer. That's why they cried out to God, and the Scripture says that he answered. Look, if you would, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, and then verse 10. Exodus 3, 7 and 8, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 10, so now go, I am sending you. Go to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Friend, God has come in the midst of our dilemma to deliver us. He hears our cry. He knows our enslavement and our suffering as a result of that. And he desires to set us free. I don't know what your Pharaoh or your Egypt looks like. Maybe it was like the man, big scrapping young man that came and knelt with me right here at the first service and said, Pastor, I got a 15-year habit of crack cocaine. Maybe it was a family who came and knelt here and said, we have a crisis with a young person in our home and it's tearing at our relationship and at the fabric of our home. You know, I don't know what your dilemma is, but God does. And if you will cry out to him, he will listen. And better than that, he will will deliver. And so the scripture says that in the midst of Israel's dilemma, God sends them a deliverer. Now, you know, I got to thinking about dilemmas. And sometimes our dilemma is from the outside. Somebody's doing something to us. Somebody has enslaved or enshackled us, but as they would learn when they received the Ten Commandments, quite often the major dilemmas of your life and mine come from where? The inside. Here's my law. If you'll follow these ten things, 
you will be blessed beyond measure. How many of you have tried to live Ten Commandments? How many of you failed? What caused that? If you don't know, let me tell you, you did. You chose against God's way, just like I chose against God's way. It put us in a a dilemma, and God has now sent a deliverer to set us free from what binds us and keeps us from purposeful living. But he has some demands. He has some demands. Look in Exodus 12, 1 through 3. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month. The first month of your year. God wants to do something so great that he's going to command you on the moment when he does it to make it your new year. You know, what do you do? What do I do? What do most people do at New Year's? Make a, what? A New Year's resolution. That's from that stuff that says, I will do this. Because you've had a dilemma of not doing this. How many of you have resolved to lose weight more than once? How many of you, like me, have lost every time? <laughs> or only one for a small amount of time. Uh, and on and on those go. But the scripture says here that this is so important, I want you to mark it. It's going to be the first month of your year. It will be the month of Bib that will begin your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day, Of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, only for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Now, God is commanding them to do something that will forever remind them. What is it that you and I need to do that will forever remind us so we don't forget? Well, I'm not sure that thing is actually established yet, is it? Because Israel didn't remember. Even though they put it in boxes around their head and around their sleeve, they still forgot. In fact, it wasn't long after this that they spent 40 years in wilderness wanderings because they could not remember. And if there's no greater problem in the church than this, this one's a good one. The reason the pews aren't filled and the reason that lives are not attracting others to Jesus is because we forgot. We forgot the cross. There's some demands. God wants us to remember. Remember that the Lord your God brought you up out of the land of Egypt and put your feet in the promised land. And I want you to remember that every morning when you get up, when you walk in the way, when you go to bed at night, remember it all the time. How often should you remind yourself of your blood-bought righteousness in Christ every single minute of your day? Because let me tell you what, you're just like they are, just like I am, you forget. And God commands us to do this, not because he forgets, but because we do. Well, there are some demands we need to remember because we need to constantly, in repentance, change what puts us back in here and keeps us from being out there. And then the final thing, the departure. When we have come to God with our dilemma, helplessly and hopelessly lost, needing only what God can do, and we follow his demands by confessing our sins and repenting, 
and doing what we should do, then God does what he does. He lets us depart. How many of you want to get out of your dilemma today? I believe you need to be a little bit more enthusiastic than that. I certainly want out of mine. Don't you want out of yours? Then you must remember that it is God and God alone. So I, I knew you'd kind of respond like that, so I want to give you four things to go with today. Turn over to chapter 14. These are the four things you need to do. And then we'll hush and go home. Verse 13 of chapter 14, Moses answers the people. Now, what are they asking him? I mean, that might be a good question, so you understand the text. God's taken them out of the hand of Pharaoh, and they have departed, and they got God between them and the chariots of Egypt on one side, and they got the sea on the other side. Now, I don't know where you grew up. But where I grew up, that's what gives rise to the saying, you're between a rock and a hard place. This is a tough, it's another what? Thank you, it's another dilemma. They've already had one. And God got them out, but now they got another one, and he needs them to practice because he knows they're going to have other what? Dilemmas. How many of you have had more than one? Absolutely. Notice what he says. Moses answers the people. Do not be afraid. What does fear get you into? A dilemma. Trust me. That's what God is saying. Trust me, I'm the God that brought you out of the hand of Pharaoh. And I know it looks impossible and undoable, but isn't that when God becomes God when we get to the end of ourselves? When we're sandwiched between two impossible situations and there's no way out unless God acts? So the first thing you do when you find yourself in a dilemma is you trust God. And then you do something that it always just seemed to not make sense to me. You know, stand firm. Well, when everything is shaking and your feet are falling out from under you, how do you stand firm? You keep believing when it doesn't look believable. When you've done all you can do to stand, Paul writes to the believers, then stand. And I want to say to Paul, are you crazy? How can you stand when you can't stand? Right. You get that? Right means God will make you to stand. So he tells them, stand firm. That's one. I mean, first, don't be afraid. Two, stand firm. Three, oh, this is the tough part. This is the tough part. Be still. I, I mean, when the army's on one side and the sea's on the other side and destruction looks like it is going to happen, chill. <laughs> Be cool. Wait. I want to ask you, in the dilemmas in your life, have you seen God act in those moments? Oh, you may have been having a panic attack. You do have them. I've had them. You know, it's, it's when fear rises to that point of escalation that we, we think destruction is imminent. Whether it's real or imagined. It's hard to be still then, isn't it? Well, preacher, I, I, I said, God, I trust you, but it didn't change. Hey, be still. Stand firm. Keep trusting. And I can tell you in the dilemmas in my life, when I've seen God work things that I thought there was no workable way out, then all I can do is say, God, you're awesome. Unbelievable. In fact, you've said this when you came out of your, can you believe that? 
<laughs> you notice that? I mean, isn't it indicative on it? Can you believe that? Well, the truth was we didn't believe it. That's why we had so much anxiety in the midst of it. Did you ever notice how in the life of Jesus he got in one dilemma after the other and he always believed that? And God always did what? Showed him victorious. Even in the face of the cross. Because on Sunday morning, the stone was rolled away. And he was risen. What God do you believe in this morning? He is the God that calls on us to trust him, to stand firm, to wait, be still, and then to put feet, move on. Raise your arms. Moses, he turned and he raised his arms and the wind of God began to blow and it blew all night. That's a long time to hold your arms up. But when daylight hit, there was no longer a barrier, but there was dry ground. And God's so good, they walked through, they rejoiced, and about the time they got to the other side, they did the same thing that you did. They turned around and looked back and said, "Uh uh-oh, I forgot they were coming. And this is why I know God's got a little redneck in him. He said, watch this. Watch this. You know, and their chariot wheels begin to be cogged up and and they begin to have confusion. And while they were in the midst of trying to straighten that out, God says, all right, wind, stop blowing. And Israel watched as 600 of the best soldiers in the Egyptian army, every last one of them, disappeared under the power of that water. God not only wants to set you free, he wants to show you his total victory over the things that make you afraid and put you in your dilemma. How do you tie this together? I'm going to do that and then we're going to have a prayer. Every one of us is in a crisis. We either just came out of it, or we're in it, or we're about to enter it. Can I get an amen on that? We got a crisis, that's our dilemma. And we need a deliverer, and God has sent a deliverer, and his name is Jesus the Christ, the anointed deliverer of God. And that Christ who comes in our crisis expects us to confess, God, I can't do it on my own. I am hopelessly and helplessly lost without you. Will you come and save me? And when we're willing to do that, the scripture says, he will give us departure if you'll put your faith and trust in me. I will set you free. I'll take you out of this to purposefulness. How many of you today can understand why Christmas? Because the same truth of the Exodus experience in Christ is true for you and me today. Amen? Stand with me.